Hi, welcome to chapter 11 of the American Pageant. We're going to do section 1 today. Uh, the chapter's over the triumphs and travails of the Jeffersonian Republic. Today we're going to look at the Federalists and Republicans mudslinging to Jeffersonian restraint. And we have some nice art here. It's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, so, the election of 1800. Uh, it's a rematch of the election of 1796. Uh, pitting the president, John Adams, against the vice president, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Adams is the Federalist, Jefferson is the Republican. Interesting thing, it'd be like Obama versus Biden right now. Um, so just kind of a little, little weird showdown going on. Uh, the Federalists fought for a strong central government. Uh, their popularity was hurt, though, by the Alien and Sedition Acts. They also were hurt because they didn't go to war with France, which is ironic because then people were voting for... Jefferson and the Republicans, and they liked France a lot, so we don't know what to do. Federalists were split over the issue of war with France. A lot of them wanted to go fight. Adams showed great restraint. Uh, in fact, some people, some historians believe he sacrificed his presidency uh, to keep our nation out of war. Hamilton published a private anti-Adams pamphlet, and it showed kind of the divisiveness of the party. Um, Republicans fought for liberty and states' rights. Uh, they liked small things, small businesses, small farmers. Uh, they weren't really into this big industry and big trade and big bankers kind of things. Uh, so it's a different vision for the United States. And so like I said, the, the, the election is very unique. The president versus the vice president. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the only time it's ever happened in our history. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Uh, Jefferson was a victim of one of the America's first whispering campaigns. This isn't Today we have, you know, 24-hour news coverage, we have social media, this would be all over Twitter and Facebook and everything. But back then people just whispered, hey, did you hear what Jefferson did? I heard he had a kid with one of his slaves. <gasps> what? No, don't say that too loud. And today we'd be tweeting it and making memes and uh, but a little different back then. Um, Federalists accused him of having an affair with one of his slaves, which uh, turned out to be true, actually. Uh, you know, DNA has proven that uh, Jefferson had offspring with his slaves. Uh, and so he's also portrayed as an atheist, which he may or may not have been. He's an enigma. He's a very uh, odd man of manic contradictions. I've pointed out before, he wrote, all men are created equal, and yet he owned slaves. Uh, he was a deist. He was a believer that the God created the earth and then kind of set it like a watch to go and left it alone. And yet at the same time, he made his own version of the Bible, um, piecing it together in order that he liked. So he really is an enigma. Uh, so there's some mudslinging going back and forth between these two. This is a, a, a political campaign, a pro-federalist, anti-Jefferson cartoon. It accuses Jefferson of sympathizing with the French Revolution and their despotid, despotism. You have Washington on, on the left, and he's a man for law and order and religion. And Jefferson, he's you know, obviously not for good things. Um, and then you got some other stuff going on here. Um, you know, the Sally Hemings kind of thing. That's, that was the slave. He supposedly and actually probably did have an affair with and uh so it was a little vicious maybe not as bad as what we have today with donald trump calling hillary a nasty woman and things like that um which will be relevant next year but um it'll go down in history as an interesting campaign in 2016. so you got adams and pinckney versus jefferson and Burr. It's a rematch of 1796. uh this is really a letter writing campaign they're not going out and and doing speeches, they're not having debates, obviously there's no television, uh, and so they just kind of wrote letters to the newspapers refuting each other. Uh, and that's how gentlemen used to campaign for office, not speaking and going place to place and having rallies, that was, that was for the common folk. These were, these were aristocratic, very gentleman-like men. Uh, Burr <clears throat> did a lot of work in New York, um, and that helped him, and then the three-fifths compromise, you know, counting slaves uh, as party representation gave the South more electoral votes uh, and kind of artificially propped up their political power. <clears throat> so the deadlock that happens is because the parties were so well organized. Back then, the original Electoral College, the electors were selected by the state legislatures. They each got two votes. Uh, and in the previous election, 1796, they weren't organized enough and they voted and they made the mistake because the Federalists didn't vote enough for Pinckney. And so that's how they ended up with Thomas Jefferson, the, their enemy, as the vice president. So this time, all the Federalists and all the uh, Republicans ca cast their two votes. Uh, the problem with that is it ended up with a tie. 
Jefferson and Burr each got 73 electoral votes. Adams got 65. And under the Constitution, when there's a tie or no majority in the Electoral College, it goes to the House of Representatives, where each state gets one vote. Uh, if a state does not have a majority, uh, if they can't pick, they forfeit their vote uh, in, in this, you know, this election. So in the House, this is, you know, this is kind of a heated thing. Um, they vote and vote and vote. Now, Aaron Burr should have stepped aside and conceded the election, but he had a chance to maybe be president. The Federalists thought it would be really funny to make Thomas Jefferson be the vice president again and give him no power, and it would kind of, you know, make their party self-implode. Uh, and so they voted 35 times, and the House was deadlocked. They, they couldn't break the tie. Uh, and so finally, on the 36th ballot, Hamilton, frustrated by this, didn't want to, you know, this, this gridlock, he didn't want to shut the government down, realized Jefferson should be the president. So he got one Federalist from New York to abstain, giving New York to Jefferson, and Jefferson wins. The Democratic Republicans can't stand Aaron Burr anymore. And this is the first kind of thing that Aaron Burr looks at Hamilton and goes, ah, oh, you ruined me. I will get you someday, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, because of this, they passed the 12th Amendment in 1803, uh, which voted for the president and vice president separately. Now the House of Representatives, if there's a tie or no majority, uh, selects the president. If there's no majority, they also have the Senate pick the vice president. So, uh, And that kind of eliminated this big problem because this was really a constitutional quagmire uh, that, that happened and, and really looked bad for a little while. So with Jefferson's election, it's called the Revolution of 1800. It's a term given the election of 1800. It signals a, a significant shift in American politics to where the ideas of the Federalists, who have you know, basically run this country since 1789 for 11 years, kind of go by the wayside. And now it's time for the Republicans uh, to have their turn at running America. Uh, no Federalist became president after this election. In fact, within 12 years of this election, excuse me, 15 or 16 years after this, the Federalists party is dead. Uh, and so it's the beginning of the end of their run, and John Adams, uh, very bitter at the end, doesn't even stick around for Jefferson's inauguration. He's, you know, he gets out early in the morning. Uh, he claimed, you know, it was Jefferson's day, and, and people portray those two as hating each other, but they become friends later on in life. They actually die, both of them, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. They die on July 4th, 1826. They became friends, letter-writing friends toward the end of their life. But Adams was bitter. He left. He was in Washington, D.C. He was the first president to live there. Uh, and then it was time for Jefferson to take over. Another look at the electoral map there if you want to take a peek at it. Uh, no popular vote yet. They're still not voting for the candidates. So he's the first president who was inaugurated in Washington, Washington D.C. Uh, Adams had moved there during his presidency. The capital went from New York City to Philadelphia ter temporarily and then finally to D.C., when he's inaugurated there, it's just a bunch of muddy streets. There's pigs roaming around. There's not a lot of buildings. But he's the first president sworn in in Washington, D.C. Uh, descriptions of him is he was tall. He's redheaded, so he was he had a ginger president. And he was cosmopolitan, which meant he liked many different things, many different cultures. Uh, he loved science. He loved reading. He had a substantial library. He did experiments. He invented things. Uh, he spoke fluent French. Uh, he was a Renaissance man who had a common touch. He did, like I said, a little bit of everything, but he did have a way with commoners. Um, even though he's an aristocrat who owned slaves and had a substantial plantation at Monticello, uh, he was in touch with what the common average American, especially a farmer, wanted and needed from the government. Uh, just to show the symbolism, he walked to his inauguration. He didn't take a coach. He didn't ride a horse. He walked, uh, much like Jimmy Carter did later in 1977. In his, in his inaugural address, he promoted democratic elements. Remember, this is the author of the Declaration of Independence, one of the most inspirational and long-lasting documents that has inspired people throughout the world and all over the globe to take up the cause of democracy or republic. Uh, in it, he tried to bring people together by saying we are all Republicans, we're all Federalists. You know, basically, let's come together. We're basically Americans. We have a lot more in common than we do in difference. Uh, and like I said, he's a man of contradictions. Uh, I kind of mentioned that a couple times here. Unlike his predecessors, though, after Jefferson's election, he dismissed very few public service, uh, servants for pub political reasons. It used to be whenever there was a new party that took over, they got all their, you know, all their enemies out and they brought in their friends to work. Uh, he didn't do that. You know, people were doing a good job at their, what they were doing. He kept them on staff. 
Uh, patronage wasn't really practiced yet. That comes with Andrew Jackson. We'll talk about that. And to the victor goes the spoils and all that stuff. And he used his charm to get things done as the party wasn't unified all the time. Uh, and he's really the driving force behind the Republican Party. So here's some other political things. Uh, commemorating the inauguration there. It's a picture from 1801. Uh, <laughs> shows here we all Republicans. We're all Federalists. And it, you know, kind of showed a little more hopeful time there. President Jefferson being inaugurated. You know, it's amazing. People have been trying to pawn off souvenirs and stuff from big events since since 1801. It looks like uh, this is an invention that Jefferson wrote. It's called a polygraph uh, from 1806, where he could write something and it would make a perfect copy as he was writing, so he didn't have to hand copy two letters and he always has you know uh, a copy on hand. So uh, Jefferson. Pardon prisoners of the Sedition Acts. This was one of the hated things that the Republicans despised about the Federalists. Um, and so he, he pardoned them. He also passed the Naturalization Law of 1802, which reduced the requirement of 14 years of re residence to the previous five years uh, to become naturalized citizens. Uh, so it was easier to become a citizen if you were an immigrant. Jefferson also did away with the hated excise tax. So the whis whiskey tax was gone. Um... The only facet of Hamilton's plan that he went after, though, even though he was opposed to the Bank of the United States, it was doing wonders for our economy. Uh, he kept the tariffs in place. Uh, and, and basically, he let Hamilton's plan work its way through. He just took away the tax. Uh, being a man of the revolution, I guess that, that was an old, uh, you know, <laughs> burr in his side. Uh, this did cost the government millions of dollars. And so maybe economically it wasn't a good idea. But at the same time, Jefferson scaled down the federal government. He thought the best government was what which, which uh, governs least, kind of like Thomas Paine. Uh, and so the federal government is reduced to just several hundred people, uh, and it's said probably it's the smallest size in American history. Some of his worker people that, that aided him, Albert Gallatin, uh, pictured here was the Secretary of Treasury. Um, he actually worked to have a balanced budget, uh, and, and so because of his work and later Madison and Monroe. The only time in American history that we did not have a federal debt was 1822, and it all started with Jefferson balancing the budget in his first years in office. Federal spending was drastically cut, and I'll go back there. I am so sorry. Uh, so you can see that there, and so that's kind of Jefferson's idea. Let's downsize the government. It's just there to protect the people, to protect the rights. Let's let the people be in charge and let the nation grow, and that's that Jeffersonian restraint. So that's it for today. Uh, we'll be moving into some of the... Uh, Kind of the, some of the stuff going on, the Judiciary Act, and we'll talk about the Supreme Court getting some of their power coming up. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comments. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a good evening.